at next is still not ready, but but Vidax, who will give us an introduction hey. to Ammonites, who are way more complex than you might think, because they are so often paleo art, but oftentimes wrong. Let's have a look. Uh, does it does it work current currently? Let's the streaming? let's see let's see. Uh huh. Go into uh, full screen mode. Uh. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it's, it's showing up for me. Yeah. Okay, yes. okay. Let's take it from the top. Uh, hello, everybody who have gathered in uh, uh, an unexpectedly large number today. Uh, my name is uh, Fran Vidakovic. I am um, a geology and paleontology student at the Faculty of Science in Zagreb, in Croatia. Uh, and uh, my interests include uh, mostly ammonites, but all sorts of different extinct animals and uh, extinct groups of organisms. Uh, if you've been a regular to uh, Paleo Stream, you may know me as Pidax. Uh, so to uh, today I'm going to give you a, qu a quick, let's hope, uh, <laughs> talk on a, uh, how to reconstruct ammonites for beginners. We're not going to go into all aspects of their biology because that would be an endless presentation, but I'm going to start with some uh, basic things and work, work my way from there. So let's get right into it. So uh, historically, ammonites have been reconstructed uh, various ways through art. And it, it's the, the, these reconstructions started uh, all the way back in the 19th century. Some of them are pretty, uh, pretty not accurate for today's standards. And most of them were kind of just copy-pasted nautiluses, only recently. Uh, there have been there has been a, a change to that trend, uh, and now I, I will try to sh try to show you why. Uh, so let's start with what is an ammonite. Ammonites are uh, mollusks. They're specifically cephalopods, and they are externally shelled, unlike modern coleoids. So they're like a nautilus in that uh, that aspect. Uh, so they have a shell, which is uh, most uh, usually a coiled. Uh, tube made out of a mineral aragonite. This tube is subdivided into chambers by something called septa, by like walls inside their shells. These wall, these chambers are connected by a siphuncle, a fleshy tube that regulates various fluids so the animal can stay buoyant and float and swim through the environment. And uh, uh, at the end, the biggest chamber, that's called the body chamber, that's where the soft body of animal is. And at the end, of the body chamber, there is an aperture or the opening where the animal would fit through. So uh, that's uh, that's what you usually find. You just find a shell. So let's start with that. Uh, how do you differentiate a nautilus, uh, a nautilus, for example, from an ammonite? Ammonites usually have a siphuncle in a different position, but that you don't usually see. Uh, but most prominently, they have different septa, which near the near the where they meet the shell wall they usually become very complex and that is not something you see w with the nautilus as you can see the nautilus has a very simple septa and very simple su so-called suture lines ammonites can also vary in complexity but especially later ones in jurassic and cretaceous are very complex uh, there is a myriad of different shapes of ammonites. They are extremely diverse there are a huge part of us of, of the um, of the fossil record, there are literal thousands of species of ammonites known uh, with ve uh, with various ornamentation, coiling styles. Uh, they can be a few millimeters uh, in in size to being a few meters in size. Uh, they are a fascinating group. Fascinating group. If you study like biodiversity and adaptation, for example. Uh, many of them are sexually dimorphic, uh, especially Jurassic and Cretaceous ones. Uh, males are usually much smaller and have weird different projections on the end of the arpitures. On the left, you can see perhaps the most extreme known example of that, where the small little uh, deformed thing, that's the male and the large normal looking ammonite, that's the female. Um, so you, hit the, you need to take care of uh, that if you, for instance, if you're reconstructing an ammonite that is sexually dimorphic, you need to check what the male and female look like. Um, beware of the preservation. Uh, when you have shell or the test, like the one on the right, you that's a good one for one what the animal would look like on the surface. 
usually. But uh, more often than not, an ammonite will be preserved as something called a steinkern or an internal mold. So there is no shell. It's just a sediment infill of the animal, uh, uh, like the, uh, like seen from the inside. Let's say you recognize that by like, uh, but by the by the fact that the suture line is visible, is visible, and they can be good analogs to shell uh, shelled animals and preserve morphology adequately, but uh, they can also lack a huge amount of information. So you need to check that. Uh, what we know about a certain ammonite you want to reconstruct. Um, how, uh, what is the orientation of the aperture? The aperture most likely varied from being almost uh, vertical, uh, like the one on the left, to being somewhere like 45 degrees and probably everywhere in between. Uh, for these normally coiled ones, it will change for the ones that I will show you later. Uh, but uh, uh, what does this? How is this impacted? It probably varied by how long the body chamber is. It probably varied on how, how what the soft tissue was like and how much of it was there. Um, I would say the ones with the shorter body chamber are probably more like more similarly oriented to the nautilus, while the ones with the bigger, like longer, uh, longer um, body chamber, they're probably more vertically oriented. Um, why all these different shell shapes? Um, uh, let's say uh, there are three most extreme shell shapes present in Amazon. The oxycon, like this placentiserant, it's the very tightly coiled, very fast growing, very flat discoidal thing. You have a serpenticone uh, that's um, uh, it's uh, it's uh, its chambers are not they're usually round or like oval but they are very openly coiled you see the coils uh, on the inside of the of the so-called umbilicals uh, coiling uh, but they're also all in all relatively flat but different in that aspect and you have the spherocon which is like a round uh, ball like ammonite ammonoid uh, and you have a lot of it in between these would be like the apices of the triangle let's say and there is a uh, everything in between uh, historically there have been a lot of assumptions made that uh, this one is the plankton this one is a demersal this one is a vertical migrant this one swim but that's basically we that's based on uh, I'm, uh, I, I, I made it up basically there is uh, it's it's an educated guess more recently there have been um, uh, actual studies with uh, models, both physical and digital, that show that, uh, for instance, the round ones they could uh, uh, they could uh, shift their aperture up and down. They could rotate very well, 360 degrees. So they were probably uh, very maneuverable in that sense. Uh, the ones that are open coiled, they were more stable side to side, but they could also shift the aperture pretty good up and down while the most stable ones that use Lee that, that that when they would jet and move they would be more more energy efficient they would be most stable in high energy environments for instance those would be the oxycons the very flat ones very tightly coiled ones so you can take it as uh, 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 take it as you will on what uh, why the uh, what uh, advantage and what ecology all of these uh, hydrodynamic advantages or hydrostatic advantage and maneuverability advantages would uh, mean for these animals. And then you have this. What do we do with this? Uh, these are called heteromorphs. Uh, it's a misleading term because there is no one thing heteromorph. It's everything that is not quote unquote normally coiled. Uh, and by normally, I mean what humans assume is normal. This, These were, in certain time periods, they, these were the most abundant types of ammonites. In the Cretaceous, this is what most ammonites probably look like in certain time periods, uh, numerically, in certain environments. Uh, what do we do with this? How were these oriented? How did these move? Uh, this is a case-by-case -case study because each of them is different. For instance, this shaft-like, uh, slightly curved to straight guys called baculated, they uh, have been proven to be, uh, they would uh, be oriented that the head is downward and then they're, they're like, um, they're, they're vertical in the water column and they could basically only move up and down actively to perhaps escape predators or to move during night and day cycles or whatever. Uh, and they cannot change their orientation in, that, in any way. These guys would like, uh, they are more normalish looking, but they have like a hooked end they have been proven that the hook would be uh, looking upward, for instance, 
uh, and uh, you can extend that to more, even more hook-like forms like these. And you can see they change during autogeny quite significantly. Uh, the more complicated you get, the more complex it, it, the change of uh, orientation gets to ontogeny. Uh, but for instance, we can say that the ones that are called like a snail at some point, uh, the the axis of uh, coiling would probably be more or less uh, vertical in the water column. Uh, and then this is the the proof that you cannot just generalize this. Uh, you you would not be able to uh, ascertain what the position of this without like a model would be. Uh, this is Niponitis, perhaps the weirdest of the amines. This was most likely a planktonic animal, probably couldn't move very efficiently. Uh, for others, we don't know. We don't know what the, the this stay uh, like uh, weird uh, Diplomoceras would be. We are not sure what Tichoceras would be oriented like. That you can make an educated guess, but uh, we must wait for the paper, as as it's said for these guys. Um, where did ammonites live? They lived at different depths in the environment. We know that from isotopes of uh, uh, carbon and oxygen that have been preserved mostly from Cretaceous shells because these are preserved well enough. And we, it, has been, it has been shown that coiling and ornamentation does not really affect in what depth the ammonite uh, lived, as has been postulated a million times in the literature before such studies were conducted, where oh, the one would say the ornamented one is the shallow water one, uh, the no, no, the other one is the shallow water one, this one lived another. We, uh, it is a very variable, and all of these advantages of a particular shell type probably were advantageous for different types of animals in a myriad environments and you cannot really assume for instance um these uh the, the hoplascaphytes different species have been proven to live at different depths but they're virtually identical in ornamentation and shell shape so it's difficult avoid generalization at uh, at, uh if if you don't know for a specific um uh for like a specific example uh, one of the coolest stuff uh, that you would not expect from ammon is that they sometimes have color patterns preserved. We have lo longitudinal stripes, like in the direction of the coiling, preserved for multiple taxa. We also have radial stripes that look like this, preserved. And uh, I think we even have dots, but I couldn't like find uh, an example of this. Um, we even have them preserved in iridescent color. Uh, these are most likely, the, the iridescent color is most likely the artifact of fossilization, although there has been no substantial research on this, and some authors have suggested that this is their actual color, but I would be very wary of that because this can change a lot during recrystallization of minerals and the rearrangement during uh, fossilization. And uh, it's likely that the pattern is real, but the color may not be, and I would be very wary of that when we constructed them. Uh, so, uh, in, in all, all in all, don't copy the Nautilus also. Uh, the Nautilus can sometimes be white. That is a rare occurrence, but it's very cool. Uh, don't just copy the Nautilus. Uh, which color can you use? Uh, anything, basically. Mollusks are very colorful animals, and uh, they vary from drab brown to uh, green, red, uh, yellow, um, black. There are all different kinds of uh, colors and patterns in these animals. Uh, except for the shells, ammonites sometimes preserve uh, their jaws. These are jaws of modern cephalopods, and they're often, you can see why they're often called beaks. They have an upper and lower jaw that look like a beak. And ammonites have that too, and it has been preserved uh, multiple times, and there is a, these are not all of the known ones. And all, each jaw looks different, indicating that these animals probably fed in a variety of different ways and uh, on different uh, different uh, types of food. Uh, to generalize, there are like four or five, let's say five, uh, four main types. The normal type that looks most similar to living uh, cephalopods, it's a very beak-like structure, and it's typical for Paleozoic and Triassic ammonites. It indicates that they were most likely some kind of predator. Uh, Anapticus is a very similar thing, but differs in morphology, so it's in a different type. Typical for early Jurassic taxa, there is a convergent thing that evolves from the next type in the Cretaceous, in Desmoceratoidae, if not, I'm not mistake, mistaken, the giant Paraputsosia, the two-meter ammonite, that's in that group. 
uh, that's also probably like a carnivorous thing. Um, Ap Apticus is the weirdest one as coined here. Uh, it's not sometimes not even pointed, almost never really hook like. And the lower jaw can be extremely large and much larger than the upper jaw. And it's usually reinforced with a calcitic plate. That's it's like, not usually, it's its defining feature. And it's very typical of Jurassic and Cretaceous ammonites. Uh, we don't really, uh, these guys probably didn't, were not strictly carnivorous in a, in a way that you would imagine. We get to that later. Uh, Rink apticus is one of the coolest one. It is similar to modern nautilus because the tip is calcified and sometimes, um, uh, uh, it even has denticles on it, and th that will imply that this is uh, also a carnivore or a scavenger of the ammonites that have this, and it's typical for tetragonitids and philoceratoides in the Cretaceous. So that is a very cool jaw type. And what what's up with the apticus? Why does it have a plate of calcite on the end? Um, sometimes this plate is very massive. Sometimes this plate has different structures on it uh, like these reticulate patterns or these ridges or even bumps like you can see on this one uh, like bumps and spikes and uh, there is even one that has been uh, found with a color pattern preserved that I unfortunately couldn't show you couldn't find it uh, this has led to suggestion that um, aside from being like a lower jaw or perhaps used for ballast and balance in the water column that this could have been inverted out of the animal somehow to be used as like either display structure or like a protective structure um, you can see that they often fit very well with the cross section of an ammonites uh, opening and this is Josh's reconstruction how that might have been might have worked if that was possible we don't really know how that would work most of the online reconstructions are uh, are not very accurate because it disarticulates the thing it would be connected with muscles or around it so we, we don't really know how that would work if and if even that would be that how it how it worked uh, for some ammonites that was definitely not true because the apticus was not uh, the right shape to be uh, um, to be uh, uh, protruded from the opening like this, hopeless, like in this hopeless caphitis. Uh, we also sometimes very rarely find a radula. A radula is like a serrated tongue, let's say. It's if the beak is the jaws, this is the teeth of the animals. And it can tell us a lot about its uh, feeding type. This is uh, modern cephalopods. Uh, ammonites have a radulas of various different shapes, ranging from very simple teeth slice structure to basically little combs on the on the on the radula. Uh, the teeth like ones were probably more, more typical carnivorous scraping and things like that. Uh, and um, the comb like ones in this baculite as one of the best preserved radulas ever has even been shown to have a plankton in it so this guy was probably filtering water through its weird apticus that does not have a beak into this comb like radula so this was a probably a pseudoplanktonic animal that even fed on smaller plankton uh the best the most important thing the soft tissue uh we know very little about it uh there are basically two slightly more preserved examples that can tell us a little bit about a, a, a soft tissue and it looks like this it does not tell you much there is even worse examples where it is just like a bit of a soft tissue preserved like a bit of a gill or a bit of a mantle uh, so what do we do let's start with what how uh, cephalopods are uh, what their anatomy is like all cephalopods being uh, nautilus all to modern cephalopods being nautilus or coleoids they have a mantle which is a flap of tissue that protects the internal organs they have a head that has a siphon it's here a collapse so you don't really see it it's a tube uh, that jets out water they have uh, ten uh, tentacles or arms they have eyes and they have a collar which connects the head to the mantle and the Nautilus has something called a hood, which we'll get to later. Um, we know about this, uh, about soft tissue a bit from muscle scars on ammonites. Uh, we know that they had big cephalic retractors, so they could retract their head into their shell quite deeply. And they have something that the Nautilus does not have, the hyponome retractor, which implies that, it had a, that ammonites had a muscular siphon. This means that unlike the Nautilus, they didn't have just a flap of tissue lo rolled like a paper um, that they would jet out water through by uh, bobbing their head 
basically they had probably a muscular siphon that could have been used to uh, to uh, that could have uh, been used directly to pump water in and out of the uh, shell and of uh, of the body of the animal to move and probably it could have bent in different directions to uh, as, to make ammonites move in sorry like, sorry like vidax uh, to to interrupt you we are running a little bit short on time uh, okay little, little okay. reminder uh, we have an intermission after this talk running but um, James uh, can basically now already pop into the second stage. This is Discord inclusive uh, stuff where he will talk during the intermission about Camp Camp Terror Sauce. So if you are not artistically inclined uh, and don't want to be sitting here drawing during the intermission, you can go down there. Uh, yeah, please continue, Vidax. Okay, I'll try to make it like three minutes. Uh... Uh, what we also know is that ammonites had uh, not all of the body was just pointing out of the aperture. There were parts of the body that were attached to the outside of the shell because they, there is a layer called the black layer or the wrinkle rail, layer sometimes preserved on the outside. Uh, so that would probably where, be where the collar, like the part where uh, between the head and the mantle would attach. So you would have, like you see in this beautiful reconstruction, probably a flap of tissue around the animal attached to the upper part and on the edges of the opening. Uh, some of the animals maybe even took that to the extreme and partially internalized their shell. That is a possibility for that th the thing called Tijoceras, but it's been a bit of bit of a debated thing but i think there is uh, good evidence for this uh, for uh, for these layers on the uh, outside of the shell um ammonites did not have hoods like nautilus why uh the hoods of the nautilus are formed by fusing a par pair of uh, arm buds in juveniles with uh, a part of the core and with a part of the eye to create this very actually derived very complicated structure that is unlikely to have evolved two times um, uh, how many tentacles did, or arms did uh, uh, ammonites have? Colioids usually have 10 to 8, while the nautilus has an incredible number of 90 arms. Uh, but the juvenile nautilus has five arm butt pails, which means that they, uh, uh, the plesiomorphy uh, is that the cephalopods likely have 10 arms. So uh, uh, ammonites could have most likely had 10 arms, but different numbers, numbers are not impossible, as evidenced by the Nautilus, who has a lot of it, and the octopus, who has uh, one pair less. Uh, what did the arm look like? Colliots have these suckers on their arms, and they have uh, often have tentacles with like uh, also suckers or uh, hooks on, on the end. And uh, the Nautilus has something called a cirrus. They have like a sheath and a thing that is rich that can protrude from, the, from, the, from that sheath. Uh, um, uh, 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 Colleates often have also something called Siri, not to be confused with the cirrus of the Nautilus, that are like fleshy uh, hairs uh, on the edges of these, uh, of these suckers. And we know that these hairs have evolved into hooks, for instance, in the extinct Belemnites. And we know that Ammonites, at least one group, uh, called scaphatids, had uh, hooks, but these hooks were probably convergent uh, to these of colioids, but their arrangement indicates that they were probably arranged on a similar power, power pair of tentacles. For the other arms, we don't really know if they were like uh, like the ones of colioids or if they were like the ones of nautilus. It's We don't have any evidence for, for that, basically. Uh, what, how the eyes like the nautilus has an eye uh, that's very simple just a, just a pin uh, just a opening in its its eye and the uh, uh, colleagues have a lens so very uh, mam uh, very tetrapod or like vertebrae like eye um we know that uh, nautilus is done however have a protein force uh, generated that kind of lens and it is not clear if that was lost through evolution, or if that is what the uh, ancestral eye looked like. So Ammonites probably had a colloid look like eye, but we don't really know. It's a, a bit of a thing that is still under research, let's say. Um, uh, here is an inspirational thing. Don't just copy uh, squids or nautiluses. Uh, be very creative with your uh, Ammonites. Look how colloids are diverse. They have various eye shapes, various arms, and they also have protrusions on their heads. Uh, so you can be very creative in that aspect, I think. Uh, a cool thing, uh, there is something called a periostracum, a fuzzy layer on some mollusks. Uh, you can make your Ammonites fuzzy, basically. Uh, different mollusks have... Uh, a fuzz or like bristly thing uh, on a layer on their shells. 
that has even been reconstructed a few times. And with ink, probably not because colloids use that to escape. Amyloids would probably not be that agile. So we don't know if they would have it, but doesn't really make a lot of sense. And chromatophores and bioluminescence, uh, probably, no, we don't know. Maybe it's something that can evolve multiple times, uh, has evolved multiple times in the animal kingdom. I would go for it in some ammonites. It's something that could have been uh, possible. Uh, so the conclusion is, uh, be very creative, use some of these bullet points to make a, like a basic anatomy thing, but we have a lot of unknowns here, and you can basically be a, uh, be very creative. This is a beautiful reconstruction by Joshua of one of the amnites I actually worked on, and that is it. Thank you for your attention, and uh, let's move into the, um, the next section when I will be uh, taking a few questions while you draw something really cool. Uh, okay, that's it. Thank Sorry you. for taking a bit more, more time. Loud clapping noises, loud clapping noises. Okay, this was our Ammonite talk, which brings us into a little intermission. You can join James below in stage two for some chem chem talk, or you can stay here and draw some Ammonites along. We have prepared a little bit. Um, let me hop over here. Uh, buh, 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 buh. Nope. Uh, where is it? There. Uh, GIMP has a blank file. And, um, okay, we thought about three different ammonites we could use for this. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Wait, I was. You need me to send the reference or? Uh, yes, please. Uh, we will do a little mini flocking now. Yep. Okay, okay. Flocking, what, what as I you... said earlier, is something that we do every Friday here on the stream, and we wanted to include this in our intermissions as well. Okay, let's go for uh, 13 minutes, because we're already a little bit into this. Um, blub, 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 blub. Should have had this open already, but it's difficult when you be on full screen. Okay, um, I think we had three different things here for selection. One is baculites, these straight ones that would migrate vertically. You need the references to be sent or? Yeah, yeah, it puts them, puts them in chat. Okay, uh, quickly, let's do this. Okay, so we go baculites first, you said. Baculites, uh, we have... Um, here are some of the, how it looked. Uh, on the like the cross section and uh, and the ridges on the thing, yeah. Yes, petite straight. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's just go with baculitis, I think. So we're just doing baculitis. Uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, you can post the other ones also in, in chat. Um, yeah, if somebody wants to do a more normally called one, uh, let's, uh, let's put in uh, this guy called Sphenodiscus. Uh, and uh, on the reference, you can see the growth lines. We don't have the aperture preserved, but the aperture would match the growth lines. On this one, you can see that it would be S-shaped. So that's uh, that's a trick. How to reconstruct it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
I can, uh, if you don't mind, Joshua, I can a answer some questions. Indeed, if there are questions, okay. um, you may go for it. Uh, okay. Uh, In the meantime, we can uh, start we know... now. For people who have paper okay. on their head. Okay. Do we know why Ammonites managed to survive the Great Dying, but didn't make past the KDE, KT of when one given that it was less severe? Okay, um, uh, the KT event is problematic because uh, the dust from the um, from the um, from the meteorite uh, uh, or, or the asteroid uh, blocked out the sun for a period, which probably killed a lot of plankton, and many Ammonites were probably were probably feeding on the plankton and their juveniles were also likely feeding on plankton because ammonites spawned in very big numbers and their juveniles were very small and probably also a part of the like the plankton community so that would probably have killed them the great dying was a bit different because ammonites back then they weren't really planktonivores i don't know if we know about a lot about their reproductions back then in the paleozoic uh, they might have been more similar to like a Nautilus in ecology, many of them, and uh, we know that the Nautilus survived the KT event, and uh, there were no uh, the the diff the mechanism of the extinction was a bit different, let's say. Uh, okay, uh, let's see what else do we have in the questions and answers. Okay. Uh, uh, how do we know which ones are males and females? Uh, it is assumed that the bi uh, small ones are males because males are uh, suggested to be more expendable. Let's say uh, they just fertilize the female. The female needs to be big to protect the brood and uh, create a lot of eggs. So that's the idea of why the smaller ones are uh, males and females. And bear in mind that not all of them are very sexual dimorphic, only some of them are. Oh, also important, uh, what we is... know that they are the same species because of the suture lines. Yeah, they have. They, they start growing in the same way. The juvenile form looks the same, they just change when they become uh, uh, mature uh, morphs. And the suture line is uh, o o always identical in these animals. What was the strangest ammonite? I would say the Diplomaceros or the one, uh, the staple, sta staple, what is it called, uh, paperclip-like one, or the, or I mean, any heteromorph basically, all of them are very weird. Uh, were there any specialized uh, predatory ammonites? I mean, probably, uh, but not predatory in a way. They were probably not similar to modern coleoids. They were not. Uh, they were not very high high speed pursuit predators probably, but many of them have uh, like like I mentioned uh, beaks that are um, that are calcified on the end, so probably they were crushing through something relatively hard or scraping bone or something like that. Uh, are there any studies that correlate the jaw type on uh, with the general shape of the amulet of the uh, and the depth that it lived at? Uh, not. To my knowledge, unfortunately. Uh, also, a bit, thing that I didn't have time to mention, uh, uh, ammonites probably need not live in the deepest sea because uh, probably not below, like, I don't know, 200, 400 meters because if they went deep enough because of the pressures, first thing, they would implode because of the pressure because they have a gas in their chamber. And uh, the second thing is their shell would dissolve because of the pressure, because where you have a high pressure, uh, aragonite tends to dissolve rather more rapidly than, for instance, calcite does, a very similar mineral that the other animals are usually made of. Uh... Okay, one question that, that I had during the talk, would uh, ammonites maybe have a hectocotylus similar to what we see in some modern colloids? Uh, we don't know, once again. Uh, Nautilus does not have a hectocotylus, it has a different organ for reproduction, but Nautilus, as you've seen, uh, I think I pretty much busted the myth that the Nautilus is quote-unquote the primitive thing, because the Nautilus is a very weird animal, very derived, very unusual morphology, and uh, perhaps, because in coleoids, hectocotylus probably evolved multiple times. It appears it, it's some, uh, some, don't, some do not have a hectocotylus, some have hectocotylus on different pairs of arms, so that's probably convergent. Some have one hectocotylus, some have a pair of hectocotyli. Uh, I would say it could be. 
it could be uh, it's something that could have popped out probably popped up a yep. few times probably for those who don't know a hectocotylus is uh, basically a sp special arm that many cephalopods have uh, that they use for reproduction it's it's basically carrying uh, the sperm for the female um, and in some species these can attach and swim by themselves to the female yep <laughs> it's weird okay uh, six minutes left How, how much do we know about the different hood shapes Nautilus might have uh, have in the past? Uh, basically, not none, because hood shapes are uh, hood is uh, uh, is a soft part. It's not an opercule, much per se. It's not made of any mineral. It's a soft, leathery thing. So, uh, I mean, it's pretty hard, apparently, from what I heard. But it's not very it's not very prone to being preserved. So we don't know basically anything. But probably it varied. With, yeah. with nautiloids uh, and uh, be careful when you think nautiloids uh, uh, you will find nautiloids at being all ex extinct cephalopods from the paleozoic but uh, this is probably something specific to something called nautilida I think like the very closest relatives of modern nautiloids that popped out like during the I think late Devonian or something like that so I wouldn't go uh, that. Uh, I wouldn't go with the hood for uh, like orthocerids or endoceras or things like that. Oh yeah, also uh, something that wasn't mentioned here because it wasn't uh, part of the topic. Nautiloids too were highly diverse in the past. Like we have only a fraction what they were previously. Uh, that's going again back into your point that Nautilus is is actually quite derived creature. Um, and uh, there were very different uh, shell shell types, so probably also the hood looked very different on on these creatures. Yeah, you can look at look up modern Allanautilus and Nautilus species. You can see that they have also a different hood shape. Yeah. When you go, and it, I think it even varies between individuals. Individuals, if I'm not wrong, if I'm not wrong here. So there was probably some. Okay, uh, how much do we know about the different hood? Okay, that was it. I wonder if you have thoughts of an opinions or regarding ovivip oviviparous ammonites. It was or it could have been uh, uh, been or just eggs on a empty uh, uh, I think uh, there has been quite a good ammonite, uh, uh, good argument made that there some of them might have been oviviparous. Some there the eggs would be laying inside the female, and the the small babies would probably emerge. But it probably again varied between taxa. Like generalizing here is a problem. There are li literal thousands of species of these guys. Uh, what are... Okay, four minutes left. Yeah, uh, Vasi asked about uh, ask about uh, what the dietary habits of ammonites. Uh, yeah, basically. Uh, they, it probably varied. Uh, yeah, but the Parapusosia reconstruction is based because it has a, like a hooked. Its relatives had a hooked beak, so that's probably it was probably more carnivorous, which is a horrifying tooth. Uh, by by how large it was, uh, Bacillites would probably filter plankton. And uh, scaphitid beaks are known, but they are they are weird because I think they were also probably. Uh, they were also probably. It it suggested they were they ate plankton, but they had uh, hooks on their arms, so it's a bit of a uncertainty here. For instance, although it should it be probably said that hooks though. could also be used for other things, of course. Yep, like mating, grappling females, or maybe yeah. defense. Uh, since like uh, for instance, hopeless cafitis could not uh, if the if the. If the apticus was used as a opercula, maybe the hooks uh, were used because the instead because the it couldn't project the thing outside its uh, outside its opening. Oh, interesting idea. Uh, I mean, we weren't nearly as agile as modern mollusks. How did these guys hunt? Uh, they probably didn't in the way uh, that you think. They probably ate food that could not uh, escape them. Basically. Uh, I I would say that uh, like either they ate very small things, they ate probably some of them probably ate things from the water floor like crabs and things like that, 
uh, or 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 maybe uh, echinoderms or something like that. Some of them probably ate carcasses. Maybe maybe they had a tactic to ambush hunt some of them. So probably it, it, we don't have any direct evidence, of course, for that. But like they were not really fast swimming animals. They were not uh, they were not really uh, like fish or like monocephalopods. Yeah. Also interesting to note, of course, we know very little about the very soft shell, but uh, soft bodied, but maybe still extremely numerous creatures like jellyfish uh, that are also very slow. So they might have been an, uh, uh, a prey item. Ooh, this is um, this is an interesting slide up topic. But have hermit crabs shared any time with ammonites? Yes, and they have shared shells with ammonites. There is a hermit crab in an ammonite preserved. I'm gonna try to. Uh... I think we find have a picture. several specimens by now, even. Yeah, I think also. I think also there's more than one, but there is one that is very. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's ah, one there famous a... specimen. Yeah, there is a new one. It does not look really as much uh, as pretty, but it's uh, it's it's also a hermit crab. I'm putting it in a lobby chat so you can maybe show it. Yeah. Like where the claw is visible. I there's also evidence that sometimes maybe fish uh, inhabited at least uh, temporarily. Uh, empty ammonite shells. Uh, I know there is one fossil from France where fish have been pre preserved in numerous specimens in, uh, in ammonite shells. So it's, it's interesting to think about from an ecological impact what these creatures might have been done for the wool of the Mesozoic. Okay, we are on our last few seconds of this intermissions. After that we have a talk by Tim and Armin about uh, the wiki project uh, paleontology okay i hope you are all done with your sketches because now we are going back into discord if you by the way if you are happy with your sketch and we would love to see them so post them on discord and on uh, social medias under the hashtag uh, um, paleostreamcon so that we might see them